My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible is strewn with failures. It's full of failure right from the early pages of Genesis all the way to the condemnation and the exhortations that were given to the seven ecclesias in Revelation. Constant examples of man failing, of promises being broken, of lies being told. Bear with me, this is going to cheer up, honestly. And the event of this evening is no exception. We have a failure. We have a failure of a disciple to, to follow his master, to do the things that should be done. Now, the rest of scripture is also littered with bright sparks of light where faith shines through, where we have victories of faith, those that rebound and recover from dire situations. And always in the midst of this, we have God involved. We have the influence of God and um, following of God's commandment, direction and mercy provided by God. And again, the incident that we have this evening is no different to that. We have an incident that has a recovery. It has a happy ending. It has the development, as Brother Paul said in his prayer, the development of a disciple. And we're all going through a level of development. When we were baptised, we were not the brother or sister that we are today. We've developed through time, circumstances have shaped us, ecclesial circumstances, the things that we have learnt, those seminal talks that really hit home to us and have changed our life. So we're going to consider one of those immense developments this evening, those, one of those amazing recoveries that we find in scripture. And this is the story arc of, of Peter, from the denial to the things that he did at the beginning of the Act of the Apostles. And I think those two ends are really interesting to compare with each other. So you go from this state where uh, Peter was denying his master. He was denying his master. The, the, the ecclesia or the, the believers around him were scattered and confused. There was a state of panic and worry and anxiety amongst the believers of Jesus. And there was fear of the authorities of the time. So Peter, the reason Peter denied was because he was fearful of what would happen if the authorities found out. And Peter goes from that state of denial, the doldrums, as it were, of, of his faith, to the things that happened in the beginning of Acts Acts chapters 2, 3, and 4 are a great demonstration of the reversal of, of Peter's life and the way in which he learnt from the things that happened um, in, in that event of the denial. And if we, we're going to look at some of those events uh, in, this, in the story arc of, of Peter, and we hear him lifting up his voice. So he wasn't huddled round a, a, some burning coals, keeping his voice down. He was proclaiming um, the Son of God and who he was associated with. He didn't fear the authorities anymore. He feared God, and he was quite happy to stand up to the authorities, particularly in chapters 3 and 4 of Acts. That's exactly what he was doing. He was stood up, and he was facing the authorities of the time, and he was standing up for God being the true authority and his message being the only one, the only message that he could ever carry. And also, what's the state of the disciples at that time? They're all together in unity and of one mind. So a big change from this um, crisis moment in Peter's life and in the life of all of the other disciples and um, moving us towards um, the examples that we provide in Acts 
um, or are provided with in Acts um, chapters 2, 3 and 4. So we see Peter's life being a microcosm of the, the recovery of the disciples back to a state where they could carry the message. And actually we find that Peter is used as a means of accelerating that recovery. It was Peter's job to get everybody back on track and to help his, um, his brethren and sisters. And we'll go into a little bit more detail of that as the evening progresses. But let's have a look at the, the different records that we have of the denial. Now, we have no shortage of them because in every single of the, uh, of the records, the gospel records, we have a record of the denial of Peter. And there's um, some interesting points that we can, we can draw from that. Let's just um, put up... Um, doesn't seem that the uh, animation's working, but there we go. Um, so here we have the four, the four different um, um, passages. John, I haven't put a particular um, verse and chapter that we're facing, because actually it's split across multiple. But if you look at um, Matthew and Mark, you see a very similar pattern of the things that lead up to the denial. You see the events um, uh, mapping out very clearly within those two chapters, almost exactly the same, um, the, the, the way in which the, those chapters uh, progress. Now, with, with Luke, you have some slight variations. Um, uh, you have some additions, so where the asterisks are there on the chart, there's two additional things which are added to that sequence. One is the dispute about who's the greatest, and one is scripture being fulfilled, an emphasis of scripture being fulfilled, and take a money bag, take a sword, and go and prepare to go out. So we get those additions. Um, and then in John, we see a completely different sequence. We see in chapter 12, all the way back in chapter 12, that's when we have the, uh, the anointing in Bethel. And then there's a big gap of teachings. There's these two big blocks of teachings that we get in John's gospel record. But in amongst those, you get the key points. You get the Passover, you get the plot of, of Judas. You get, importantly, the betrayal foretold. So we get a foretelling of this, of this, um, uh, of this betrayal that's going to happen. And I think that's really important in every single case. Then in John, you get some teachings, you get warnings that he's going away and coming back again. And then you have that beautiful prayer in John 17, a prayer for his disciples. But then you still get the betrayal, the trial, and then the denial of Peter. Now, there are some interesting differences in the four records. And I haven't got to the bottom of all of them. So um, maybe a subject for the, um, the discussion afterwards. Um, so for instance, in Mark, Mark is the only one that talks about the cock crowing twice. Did you know that? Um, so that's the only record that talks about the cock crowing twice um, and then you'll deny me thrice. So you get those two uh, put um, against each other. Luke is the only one that talks about an hour gap between uh, the second denial and the third denial. Um, in the first three, Matthew, Mark and Luke is, are the three that... Peter goes out and, and weeps afterwards. He weeps bitterly. And, and like you can imagine, can't you, the, the desolation and the sorrow that he must feel based on the fact that he's just denied and done exactly what Jesus said he would do. Whereas John doesn't mention him weeping at all. It just ends, as you've just read, um, as you've read together, um, the cock crew, and that's the end of the, that record. So there are differences um, and I think there's two major differences, I think, which is uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke are dealing with um, a development of this individual and using him as a catalyst to get all the other disciples back. And I think the John incident is emphasising more the fact that he, that the manner of death in which he would die. And, he's, and it's using the incident and emphasising other aspects. Um, Luke, for instance, is a very personal account. You get some very personal things said to Peter. And also, in the Luke account, is the only one 
where Jesus turns and looks at Peter when he's denied. And imagine that look again. So, there's so there are some differences in the, in the four records. Um, and what we're going to do, first of all, is look at um, maybe the sequence that happens in this in these Matthew, Mark and Luke and see if we can draw anything from those first and then what we'll do is we'll spend a bit of time looking at the John record and just deconstructing a couple of things from the John record. So first of all then, let's have a look at, um, let's have a look at uh, the, the, the things that precede the sequence of events in Matthew, Mark and Luke because they're all very similar and it all, I think, um, links with um, events in that, in that chapter, the, the praying of Jesus. So Jesus prays three times in, in Matthew, Mark, and once it's recorded in, in Luke. And he prays in the garden. And I think there's something that happens beforehand which links to that. So let's go and have a look in Matthew um, chapter 25. So in Matthew 25, you have... Again, these are all very famous chapters with important messages um, in them. So in, in the end of that one, you have that description of the kingdom and when did we see you hungry and thirsty, etc. Um, but at the beginning of uh, Matthew 25, you have a, a be the beginning of a sequence of, of three teachings. And the first one is this. Um, the kingdom of heaven is likened to ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth um, to meet the bridegroom. And what is the point of that, of that parable? The point of that parable is given to us in verse 13. In verse 13 it says, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So before the sequence of things that happens leading up to the denial of Peter, we have this important message, watch. You don't know what the day is. And this is talking about Jesus going away and coming back again. Jesus going away and coming back again. Watch. And then if you go and have a look in Mark 13, you have a similar, um, similar incident that happens just before this sequence. So in Mark um, 13... And verse 32, this is just before the beginning of chapter, 30, uh, chapter 14. But I say unto you that um, the hour knoweth no man, not the angels in heaven, neither the Son of Man. But take heed, watch and pray, um, for ye know not what, the, t what uh, the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly you f um, he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Again, common theme. Then you go straight into the Passover, and then you go into this sequence of events that leads to the denial of Jesus. Go to Luke 20, go to Luke 21. This is a slightly shorter uh, sort of version of the same kind of message. So in Luke 21, again, just before this sequence that um, goes into the Passover, Luke 21, verse 34, uh, we have, take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and all at the day come upon you unawares. This day coming upon you unawares. So you have this idea of watching. Now, what happened in the garden? Three times it happened in the garden. Jesus gave them all a mini test. What are you going to do when I go away and come back again? So I'm going to go away and I'm going to go and pray over there. I'm only there, I'm only a stone's throw away, but I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to do it three times. I'm going to ask you when I come back, why are you not watching? Why are you asleep? The same words are used when, when they're in the garden. And who is it that Jesus talks to initially when, when that happens? So in the garden, um, Jesus has gone off 
into a, a stone's throw away. He's gone a, a, to pray yonder, as it says in verse 36. Matthew 26, verse 40. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep. Exactly what he told them not to do in this example of the kingdom coming. Now, this is a mini version of that, him going off to pray and coming back again. What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Like, you're going to have to watch for a lot longer than one hour. But could you not watch one hour? And who is it he's spoken to? It's Peter. He saith unto Peter. So Peter is already demonstrating that he hasn't quite got the spiritual maturity to deal with the situations that are going to happen. So he's already, he's not quite done what Jesus wanted them to do, which is to watch. And this sequence of events that happens that I put on the screen um, in the previous slide, this one here, this is taking us from a time when Jesus had all of his disciples around him in a very pleasant situation, then washing and then being together. And at the end of that sequence, he's got nobody with him apart from God. And everybody else has gone. Betrayals have happened. Denials have happened. And Jesus has gone from a situation where he had people around him to a state where he didn't have anybody with him at all. Not even this tenacious disciple who absolutely proclaimed that he would never deny him. Even he has gone and he's denied him. And so what Jesus is doing here, I think, is all the way through this sequence, he's not just thinking about himself and the own, his own trials that he's got to go through. He's actually building a groundwork of preparation in his disciples. And he's giving them these things to prepare their minds for a time when they will have to return back to him. And he's giving them all the tools and the techniques that they need to do that. Now, we can see this process starting um, in uh, Luke chapter 9. So if you go to Luke chapter 9, and, and also in, in Matthew um, 16 as well, we see something similar. But let's just, let's just stick with the Luke account of this. So we see a process of Jesus preparing his disciples ready for the time when he would go away. And he started really early. So in um, Luke uh, 9 verse 20, it says, And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ um, of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them that, no, that you tell no man this thing, saying, and this is the point where in Matthew, I think it says, from that time forth, he, he told them this, he kept repeating it, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders uh, and the chief priests and scribes and slain and be raised on the third day. So they'd been told. And in fact, they were told many times that this would happen. So why were they surprised when it actually happened? Now, there seems to be... Um, a precedent for this, I think later in Luke, when you've got the people going to Emmaus, these, he was hidden from them. So I think these things were hidden from them. And what, what Jesus was doing here is he was putting into their minds the things that they would need in storage, as it were, ready to recall when the events happened. So he, they had everything there and they, went, they would go, oh, now I get it. Because they would have had all of the, the advice and the guidance that Jesus would have laid the groundwork and preparation for them to quickly respond. So let's have a look at what he continues to say in this passage, which links with what we're talking about this evening. So in verse 23, it says, And he said unto them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. That's almost a mini version of what happens in the denial. He's given a verse here which says, I'm going to be slain on the third day, raised again. And if anybody wants to follow me, which Peter he definitely wants to follow him, he says that uh, in John, I want to follow you. Well, what have you got to do? You've got to deny yourself. When you're stood in front of these servants and you're saying I don't know who Jesus is that's not denying yourself that's denying Christ 
And so here is an example of, of Jesus giving them all the necessary information that they are going to need when um, it's time to turn. And, and um, we get this interesting um, link between what happens when Jesus starts to talk to the disciples and starts to build his disciples, um, his group of disciples, and, and what happens just before he gets taken for trial. So in Mark chapter 1, verse 18, this is when Peter is, is, is called away. What happens? Straightway, they forsook their nets and followed him. They forsook their nets. They left their nets behind and they followed Jesus. Now, what happened in Mark um, 14 and verse 50? What happened there? Well, they all forsook him and fled. And so there's this reversal of what happened. They went away from him and they abandoned Jesus in the opposite of what happened before. And these words of preparation were really important. Now, I said before that, Luke, uh, that in the Luke record, we get a very personal message to Peter. And in Luke, you get a very personal message, essentially saying, Peter, you are the person, you are the one disciple that I'm going to use to bring every other disciple back. You are the person who is going to turn around and you're going to come back to me and you're going to bring the other disciples with me. Let's go and have a look at that in Luke chapter 22. Now, I've put the net version on just because it's absolutely blatantly obvious, the pronouns um, that, that are being used here. But if you're good at your yees and yows and thous and thems and etc., cetera, you'll, you'll be able to recognize the same um, pl pl plural and singular um, pronouns within your uh, King James version. Um, but I'll just read it from the screen here where it says, so this is Luke 22 now. And again, this is the, this is the, um, the record of the foretelling of the denial. Um, it says, Simon, Simon, pay attention. Satan has demanded to have you all to sift you like wheat. So all of you disciples are going to be sifted like wheat. All of you, the whole group of you. That's what's going to happen. And then he switches pronouns to a personal message to uh, Peter. And he says, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. When you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. In the AV, I think the word is converted. So when you have converted, turn around and strengthen your brothers. So you are going to be the one that is, strength, is going to be strengthening your brethren. Verse 32. And how does, Jesus, how does Jesus do that? How does he make him ready to turn around? Well, he basically gives him an alarm clock. Like if we, if we went and every time we did something wrong, an alarm went on our phone, we'd be quite good at identifying the things that went wrong, wouldn't we? Well, this is what Jesus gave to Peter. He gave him an alarm clock and said, you're going to deny me three times. When that happens, there's going to be an alarm that goes off. The cock is going to crow and you will know that you have just done the exact thing that you said that you were not going to do. You will have denied me. And so what Jesus did was gave him a catalyst to turn back. So he put into the ear of, of Peter this alarm clock. When you hear the cock crow twice, as it is in Mark, then you will, you will know that it's all gone wrong. You will know that you're at the, the, the lowest point in your spiritual life, and it's only up from here. And when you do turn, because I know you're going to turn, I've prayed for you. When you do turn, strengthen your brethren. Bring them back with you. You are going to be the catalyst that's going to bring all of these others back with you. You are going to, I'm going to give you a trigger. That trigger is the cock crowing. And you will know you have failed. You will know you have denied me. You'll know that you, you haven't done the thing that you said you wanted, which was to deny self and to follow me. But actually you've denied 
if it's not the right way around. Um, you have denied me. So you have denied um, Jesus. And that's exactly what Peter did. Peter did exactly as was advertised. He turned round and he actually helped everybody else. Now let's go and have a look at this because this is really cool. Go and have a look in Acts chapter 3 because this is, is the work now of Peter. And Peter is working now. This is many days later, 40 plus days later. Um, but look at the phraseology that's used here. So in, in, in Acts chapter 3, um, what's going on? Well, he's um, helping, helping somebody, isn't he? He's helping a lame man. Such as I have, give I thee. That's a phrase that we all learn in Sunday school, isn't it? Um, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. In such as I have, give I thee. What has he got? Well, he's got the keys to the kingdom, hasn't he? He's, um, he's got the message of hope. Well, I'm going to give you that now, um, lame man. I'm going to teach you it. Um, and how do people respond when, when he's done that? And as the lame man, verse 11 uh, which had, was healed, um, held Peter and John. The people ran together and called um, in the porch and called with um, Solomon, greatly wondering. Verse 13, and, he, and Peter starts to see it and he starts to, to, starts to preach. And he says in verse 13, the, king, the, um, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go, but ye denied the Holy One, the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. And Peter is in a great position to say, guys, I've been there. I've denied, but I've turned. I've turned back. Um, and what does he talk, what, um, how does he um, describe his relationship uh, with these with these people he calls them his brethren i'm not sure where that is um, but later on in here it, it, he calls them his brethren 17. 17 thank you and now brethren i wot that through ignorance ye did it as did also your rulers they were his brethren just like jesus had told him go and strengthen your brethren and what is he telling them to do verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted, be turned around, that your sins may not be blotted out, just like my sins were blotted out, uh, um, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So, so Peter is doing this job. He's doing the job that he was given in Luke, and he was helping his, his brethren to turn. So I think we see in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, a really interesting um, construction of the denial of Peter and used as a way to accelerate the returning of the disciples back to Jesus. And using Peter, yes, he didn't do the right thing, but he was given a way of accelerating the return of the disciples back to Jesus. Now let's go and have a look at John's record, because John's record is, is very interesting as well. So we read together, didn't we, the, um, the record of, his, uh, of the denial itself. But in John 13, all the way back in John 13, is when we get um, the, the record of the, the foretelling of that, the prediction. So in John 13 and verse 36, it says, Simon Peter said unto him, Whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me, but now, but thou um, shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. I will lay down thy life for thy sake. Will he? Will he do that? Verse 38, Jesus said unto him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto ye, the cock shall not crow, till thou shalt denied me thrice. Now, and I think that that wilt thou, wilt thou um, lay down thy life for my sake is answered right at the end of John. 
And we get an answer to that. And the answer actually turns out to be yes. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's have a look at the actual events that happened in the denial, first of all. So in the denial, if we go to chapter 18, and I'll put this on the screen. Uh, on the screen, you'll see um, the three denials. The text is probably quite hard to read, actually, but anyway. Um, so we've got the three denials, um, and it's just interesting the sequence that it's put in, because in John's record, you have a break between the first and the last two of the denials. You have a break. And I think the break is there to emphasise a point. So let's have a look at um, verse 15 to 17. That's the first denial. So it's all about getting into the, getting into the, um, the, the place where the trial is. Now, John's obviously, he's got a ticket. He's in. And John then comes out and he lets Peter in. And he speaks to the servant who's on the, on the, um, the door and says, oh, I, know, I know Peter, you can bring him in. That's a paraphrase. That's not the authorised version. Okay, so in verse, in verse um, 17 it says, Then saith the damsel um, that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? And he saith, I am not. And the servants' officers stood there, and he made a fire of coals, and, and they warmed themselves. Now you then get a break, and the, and the camera, so if you was just like a movie, yeah. So the camera pans from the doorway where Peter has just got in and it pans round to Jesus in the trial situation and he's being asked a question. Okay, so and the, and the question is asked um, and Jesus answers and says, I, I talk very openly. Um, it was the, and the question was about his doctrine. I talk very openly. I didn't hide it. Um, I was in the synagogue where the Jews are always resorted, verse 20. And then he asks a question, verse 21. Why askest thou me? Don't ask me about it. All the people who have heard me. Ask them which heard me that I have said unto them, uh, uh, um, what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. Camera pans across to Peter. Peter is one of those people who has heard the words of Jesus. He's very capable of saying, what is it that he said? And there's, he's there in the room. Go and ask him. He's just over there by the fire with John. Go and ask him. And in fact, it seems like some people do ask him. And what does he say? And uh, so you, you go down to the, uh, the next, uh, so it pans back. Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, therefore, art not thou also one of his disciples? He's asked, and he denied it. I am not. You're not going to get the answer from me tonight, says Peter. You're not going to get an answer to that question. And I think that's why that question is put there, because... It's essentially linking the fact that in that room there were a couple of disciples and Peter was actually said, no, I'm not going to support what Jesus is saying in the centre there. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to ratify what is being said. And then you get one of the, one of the uh, servants, high priest, the kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, which I think is important. That's the only time you get a reference to this third person being linked to the events in the garden. Saith, did I not see thee in the garden with them? And Peter denied it again. And it's interesting, the phrases that he uses. So Peter uses, I am not. He says, I am not, in both of those first two. And then in the third one, he just denies it. He doesn't say what his, his words were. And that links, I think, to the events in the garden just a few moments before. And if you go all the way back to verse 6, we're in the garden. And some people stride into the garden. And they, and they ask, and they ask, um, they ask who, where Jesus is. And they answered him, verse 5, Jesus of Nazareth. Who, it says, whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth. Um, say, saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood up with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am, um, I am he, they went backwards and fell on the ground. So it's emphasising 
the strength of those words. Like, this, these words, I am, and this declaration that you are Jesus of Nazareth, it made them fall to the ground. What did Jesus do again? And he said, and they, and he said whom seek ye? And, and, he, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he answered and told you, I am. I am he. He said it again. And then what, you have the incident with the cutting off of of um, the servant's name, uh, Malchus, um, of, his, of his ear. And what does Jesus say in response to that? So here's a physical act of somebody trying to prevent it, like chopping off an ear of a, of a servant. And he goes over to Peter and he says, put your sword away, put it into your sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall not I drink it? Two I ams, and I will drink this cup. That's what Jesus says in the garden. He does not deny who he is. He doesn't back away from his, his job that he's got to do. And if you put that against what Peter does, he's got two I am nots. And then the last denial is linked with that event of the cutting off of the ear of the servant. So in verse 26, the person who was actually a kinsman of the person who, who Peter cut off um, the ear of, if that's the right... <laughs> There's quite a few words there, isn't there? But you know what I mean. Um, in verse 26, saith, did I not see thee in the garden with him? And he denied it. So there seems to be a link between the I am's in, of Jesus in the garden and the I am nots of, of Peter in that declaration and those denial um, against him. But the story doesn't end there, because the conclusion of Peter's story within um, John's uh, record is actually three affirmatives, three things where he says, I love thee, you know I love you. And we see that, don't we? Right at the end of, of John, we see these three um, times that Jesus um, asks him this question. Threes happen a lot in Peter's life. And again, this is something maybe for discussion. Threes happen a lot in, in the life of Peter. Uh, so you obviously have um, the three times that he denies. You have the three times that he's um, awake. Uh, he should have been awake when he was asleep in the, in the garden. He has these three, uh, um, uh, do you love me, incident in John. You have the three times that the sheet is raised down and then God goes up again. There you go. It's a fun fact for the, for the evening. Uh, if there's anything in that, please let me know. Um, but we have, at the end of John, we have this, um, these three times that he says that I, I love thee. So in verses 15 through to 17, um, and, they, and they dine together. Um, Lovest thou me more than these? And he saith, yea, Lord, yea, Lord. Yes, I do. Thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, feed my lambs. And again, you get this in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, don't you? In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, you get the continuation of this feeding that's then given to the rest of the apostles uh, that then actually happens uh, with, with the, the continued work of the preaching of the gospel. And he saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, feed my sheep. And he saith unto him the third time, Simon, thou son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because um, he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest that all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And so it's almost like the, the number of times that three is used in scripture is important. And you get the three witnesses. You get times when um, you get the three, um, threefold cord is not easily broken. All these things which are, uh, are, are types within scripture, these threes. And what Jesus is doing here is he's wrapping up this problem that was this development of Peter. And he's getting him to declare three times that I love thee. And he's linking that with the job he gave him in Luke, which was 
to turn all of the disciples back and to help the disciples to turn back and to feed his flock. And then how does this record end? It ends by answering the question that was asked back in chapter 13. Wilt thou follow, will thou lay up thy life? Or words to that effect. Will you? Well, in this chapter, right at the end of John's record, he says, yes, actually, that is going to happen. That is going to happen. You will follow me. And that was the big question in John 13. Will you follow? I will follow you. Well, at the moment, you won't follow me, but you're going to do lots of learning and you'll get to the point where you can follow me. Verse 18, verily I say unto you, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou art old, and thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And he spake, he signifying, by what death he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. So now it was the time that Peter could follow him. He'd gone through the spiritual development. He'd done everything that was needed to get him to the stage where he could follow Jesus. And he'd gone into the depths of despair and he'd clawed himself back from it and he'd helped his brethren and sisters um, to return um, as well. So I think that's why we get the structure within John in the way that, in the way that it is. And, and that narrative structure of the development of John from somebody who couldn't follow Jesus to death, but now can. He now can follow him. So let's turn this now, and in, in, in the last minute or two, turn it on onto, onto ourselves. And how can we look at this lesson of Peter as a, as a lesson of development for ourselves? So we saw, didn't we, that, that Peter was given a catalyst to recover. Um, he was given that cock crowing that was the trigger for him to come back and to turn and to be converted. And so his recovery was aided by Jesus. And I think we have something similar. So if we were to think about our own situation, if we are in a situation, a problems, where we find ourselves denying Jesus, where we find ourselves satisfying flesh and self rather than denying self, then we have something that can bring us back. We have scripture. And we have these words, don't we, from 1 Corinthians 10, which is, no temptation has taken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he also provide a way of escape that you may endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. And so, yes, the Bible, it is strewn with failures, isn't it? It's strewn with with problems of man, but it's also full of things that can help us and examples that we can use in order to speed up our recovery. What are we going to use as the cock crowing for us? What is going to be that speedy reminder for us that we need to deny self and, and follow Jesus? And when we have these words nestled in our minds, just as Jesus had prepared the disciples, we can call on them quickly. And we can get to the state, can't we, where we are together and we are of one mind as a community. And we can be in a state where we can lift up our voices in praise to our Heavenly Father.